It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon. Welcome. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm Pete McGuinness Mark, and today we're going to be exploring the solar system. We have a very special guest with us today, Dr. Ed Scott, who is an emeritus researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa. Welcome, Ed. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I've seen some of the slides, and I'm sure the viewers are going to just find this a fascinating uh, program today. You're going to be talking to us about a mixture of things, though. So you're going to talk about meteorites, asteroids, yes. and what that tells us about the early solar system. Is that correct? That's right, yes. Okay. And, and you know, some people have heard about meteorites. They've heard vague things about what these asteroids are. Hopefully we're going to learn today something about the interconnected mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the story which they can tell us about things happening in the solar system. How long ago are we going to go back in time? Uh, well, we're starting four and a half billion years ago. Four and a half billion years. Which is years, huh? the age we get from the meteorites. That is a long that time. tell huh? us exactly when the solar system started. Unbelievable. Is, Great. And it's amazing that in the kind of research you do, we can actually go back that far in time. Yes, and, and the, the age of the rock is crucial to understanding the story. Okay. okay. Well, as I said, you've brought along some slides, so why don't we go to the first image, and, and this will introduce us to the whole problem of what an asteroid looks like, and, okay. and well, just describe to us what, what we're seeing here. So this is an asteroid called uh, Itakawa, photographed by a Japanese spacecraft. It's about uh, 500 yards long. And that would be, what, about the size of Diamond Head Craters? About Diamond Head Crater, okay. yes, uh -huh. absolutely. And uh, this was the first small asteroid that we had seen in such detail, and as you can see, it, okay. it looks like a pile of rocks. And yes, it does. <laughs> which is exactly what we would hope in many ways. And, and you say this is a small asteroid. So the largest are a thousand kilometers across and they okay. go all the way down to a few meters in size. Okay, and, and in Itakawa, that image which you showed us, um, there are a number of rocks, you say, on the surface. So the sun's shining from which direction? The, the left, Looks yes. like from the left-hand side, yes. yes. Okay, that's it. And you've got quite a variety, some really big boulders like the one on the right-hand side. Presumably that's, you know, house size or something like that. Absolutely, that yes. And then there are smooth areas with dust on them. But uh, basically, yes, a collection of, of rocks that are reassembled after an impact. Okay, and, and where is Itikawa? So we, we know, is this uh, near the Earth? Should we worry about it? Or is oh. it far <laughs> out in space beyond Jupiter? Well, uh, the asteroids go around the sun between Mars and Jupiter. Okay. Um, uh, so we, we don't have to worry about them. Occasionally, Good. They, their orbits get changed, and uh, a small piece hits the Earth, and we have a meteorite. Okay. But luckily, that... Or if you were a dinosaur, you would have to worry about it. Absolutely, yes. Okay. 65 million years ago, there was a larger one, about a kilometer, right, a few right. kilometers across, which hit the and, Earth. And so the rocks which we saw in that image, um, they sometimes jump off of the surface of the asteroid oh. <laughs> and come to Earth, or, or how does this work? Well, uh, curiously enough, that picture of Itakawa is missing something, and that's the, the impact craters. It's one of the few bodies in the solar system that doesn't, isn't okay. peppered with impact craters. They do form. There are lots of impacts. It's just that there's so much rubble that we don't and, see them. And in previous shows, we've learned that if there were impact craters, these holes in the ground, the more holes per unit area, the older the surface. Absolutely, is that yes, yeah, yes. Okay. And this is a very old uh, collection of rocks. But because of all these uh, impacts in the solar system, that we get fragments from asteroids right. so, like Itakawa. All right, so we've got a whole series of rocks on the surface. Do we just study them on the surface of the asteroid, or do we have samples? You, you brought some yes. rocks in. To show, I, I'm guessing that there must be a connection here between what we saw in the Ab first Absolutely, image. yes. Okay. We, we know from the work uh, that has been done on the samples that were brought back from Itakawa that we do have meteorites okay. that are very closely related okay. to the rocks. That and and this Itakawa. is research which is being done at the University of Hawaii? Yes, yes. Okay. We have a group of planetary scientists uh, who study meteorites. Excellent. Okay. And uh, so I'm mm -hmm. privileged to be part of that group. Wonderful. Well, we, as we have some meteorites here, 
show the viewers some of these meteors. Okay. Tell us a little bit about some of them. So these are small samples, but nevertheless, you will get the idea that uh, rocks come to the surface of the Earth because of impacts in space. And uh, usually they are small, a few pounds in size, a few kilograms. Sometimes, as we said, they're very large. Yeah. This is a piece of, uh, that weighs a few hundred grams, and you can yeah. see it's, uh, it's made up of metal. Uh -huh. iron nickel metal and silicates okay. the silicates are perfectly ordinary silicates and this this flat surface here that's not uh, the way that the meteorite fell to earth absolutely yes yeah. the outside is you can see it's rounded brownish and when it's cut and polished then you can see the metal grains inside okay and how do you know it's a meteorite so uh, you won't find metal grains inside rocks <laughs> from the earth <laughs> Yeah, because conditions are so oxidizing. Okay. okay. So uh, yeah, if you ever find a, a funny looking rock with metal grains in, it's almost certainly a meteorite. Okay. And, and presumably you don't find them that common in Hawaii. Where, where do you no. collect meteorites? You want somewhere dry, well, a dry desert or Antarctica, certain okay. areas where there's no precipitation. Okay. So none of these rocks actually come from Hawaii? No, there, there are only two that have been seem to fall and they're okay. covered in Hawaii. Right. Every, everything else that we study is... This, this one here is a particularly pretty one. What, what is that? What, what? That's a mixture of the iron nickel metal, uh -huh. the same, roughly the same composition as the metal grains in the, in the first one we looked at. But uh, in addition, we have these large crystals of olivine, dunite. So like uh, green sand, yeah. same, okay. same mineral. Okay. And uh, so it's an amazing meteorite that is a mixture of these materials, which are very common in, in space, the iron nickel metal and the silicate, which is just magnesium iron, silicon and oxygen. All right. But presumably this one wouldn't be just lying around the surface of that asteroid you showed us, would it? I, I mean, this is another one that's been cut and polished to yeah. show us the structure, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but going back to, to the first one we looked at, what, what makes this meteorite really un remarkable is it's composed of a whole collection of, of different materials. And if we look at the next image, okay. we what? can see a, a, what uh, is it. Wow, and what is this? So it's a picture of a thin slice of a rock like, like this one. It's about uh, an inch across in a microscope. Okay. And you can see it's just chock-a-block with little round spherules we call chondrules. So the rock is called a chondrite. And the small millimeter-sized spherules are chondrules, which are, were once drops of molten magma hmm. in space. In space. So you'd had the. <laughs> would that be a volcanic eruption, or would that be when? That they was one of the earliest that, ideas that it okay. was, but uh -huh. we we don't think it was a volcanic okay. eruption. And, and the colours in that particular image, do they tell you something about the chemistry of the rock, or how it cooled, or? Yes, I mean, each, each of those particles has a history to tell about uh, how it formed, what its composition is, and how it uh, quickly it cooled. They, they cooled very quickly in minutes, hours. Uh -huh. So it, we're talking about droplets that were in space. We're not talking about uh, droplets on the surface of, a, of an asteroid. They eventually came together and made an asteroid, but what we're looking at are particles that were freely floating around in this disk of, of material from which the planets were made. Okay, so these, those particles are very old, presumably. Absolutely, they date from yes. the age of the solar system's formation. Absolutely, yes. Yes, yeah. four, four and a half billion years old. Wow. So, so that's the oldest rock that you'll ever touch. <laughs> this one right here is the oldest <laughs> rock. Okay. Yes. And, and I've been on Kilauea Volcano, I've touched some of the youngest rocks. Absolutely, yes. The what whole a... <laughs> age distribution of the solar system. Wow. Yes. It's uh, mind-boggling that you can... The, the you rocks can will tell us for half billion years of history. How do you get history. the ages? I mean, yeah. So there are radioactive clocks, what we call uh, okay. decay of radioactive elements. We mm -hmm. know the rate at which they decay. And if you can measure what's left and infer what was there originally, then okay. you can... So it's like radiocarbon dating, except much older than that. That's it. Exactly yes. the okay. same principle, okay. yes. Wow. Yeah. Very good. And, Only and it's much more difficult, of course. I have to have to admit that an old rock could have been he heated up by an impact 
for example. So you, ha you can only date the really pristine meteorites. I see. Pristine means completely unaltered. Unaltered right? by, by heating and impact and uh, okay. other things okay. that can happen and, in space. And we have two other samples here. We have a, a really heavy one, which I presume is just the, the iron. That's it. All right. Yes, so there are some meteorites that are virtually all iron nickel. And, and then, then this one has a much lower density than this one, the one in this hand here, my left hand. Yes. It's this much lower density. It's about half the density of this. So do these come from different parts of the same asteroid? or? Yes. If you, if you have an asteroid like the first one we saw, which is a yeah. mixture of metal and silicate, mm -hmm. and it gets heated up by radioactivity, then the metal is very dense and goes to the core of the asteroid. Okay. And we think that the iron meteorites are from the cores of asteroids that melted. So and the lighter, less dense rocks are from the mantle material. We don't have one here. But so we, like we, we, we don't know if these all came from the same asteroid. We are quite confident they come from different ones. Hypothetically, this really dense iron one would be in the middle. Absolutely, yes. And then that's you'd it. have this lovely one between the core and the next layer, it, which you said was called the mantle. Yes. Okay. And then this one here would be. This is actually the starting material. That's this the one. starting material. Yes, that's it. So this has everything you need to make all the other meteorites. Okay. It's like a little detective story, isn't it? Oh, but absolutely, yes. Yeah, you, you find all these samples, and presumably, how many meteorites do we have here on the Earth? Uh, yes. It's something like six, 50 or 60,000 now. When so, and they must all tell basically the same story, because they Yes, the I mean, the, the first job, if you get a meteorite, is to see which pile it belongs to. Okay. And we have a, a samples, we think, from over 100 different asteroids. And, and, and that categorization is what you do at the university or do you look at them in thin section or do you age date what what do you do yeah we study them under the microscope okay uh, starting out with an optical microscope and then using electron microscopes for more information okay. and then we collaborate with other people who will make different types of chemical or isotopic measurements interesting and and at what level of detail do you do you need you know if one of our viewers is watching and she actually is interested in doing this work. I mean, do you need better microscopes, or do you need... Uh, I mean, most, most meteorites that are found are, are rather like this one. Uh -huh. uh, so all you need is a, 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 a knock off the corner, make a thin section, and study that. Okay. If it's the same type, then you, we probably wouldn't... Uh, we've, there are another 30,000 like this. Okay, so you put that one aside. That would be put and aside. Just look for the really. We look for ones. the ones which are unusual, like are very well preserved okay. or from a different. I, th different I, th I think body. I would pick on this one first of all. I, mean, I, 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 I like those this very is much. Just yes, beautiful. They, they are spectacular. Uh, and great. we we have these are called palisites, uh -huh. and uh, we have about thirty different ones, and twenty five of them come from the same asteroid. Okay. And then there are another group that comes from a second asteroid, and then there are a few more that come from Okay, three well, more. we're getting close to a break, but I, I'm hoping you'll be able to tell us a bit more about you know, what the diversity of these asteroids really are as we sort of look out from Earth throughout the, the rest of the solar system, that presumably they come, meteorites come from different asteroids, which are lurking at different distances away from the sun, have different geological histories, or maybe they're involved in different chemical processes. So um, I think when we come back after the break, uh, we'll look forward to hearing a bit more about some of the uh, diversity. Just to remind you, you are watching Think Tech Hawaii, research in Manoa. I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and my guest today is Dr. Ed Scott, who is an emeritus researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Monoa, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Nicole Alexander Enos, and I was born three weeks ago. Congratulations on being there for me for some of the few weeks of my life. I'm starting a new show, The Millennial Mind, every Wednesday at 2 p.m. for the month of April, where we'll go over some of the reasons why millennials are some of the most anxious and frustrated people at the moment. Ah! Aloha, my name is John Waihe. 
And I used to be a part of all the things that you might be angry at. I served in government here and may have made decisions that affects you. So I want to invite you in. I want to invite you in to talk story with me and some very special guests every other Monday here at Talk Story with John Wahee. Come on in, join us, express your opinion, learn more about your state, and then do something about it. Aloha. And welcome back. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, Research in Manoa. I'm Pete mcginnis Mark, and my guest today is Dr. Ed Scott, who is an emeritus professor at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa. Now, Ed, just before the break, you were talking to us about some molten rock, okay, in some of these meteorites. How do you get molten rock? Do we see any examples of an asteroid that might have been molten? Or? Okay, uh, certainly, yes. Let's, let's go to the next picture. And this is a, a picture of, a, of an asteroid called Vesta. It's about 500 kilometers across. Okay, and, and we 500 kilometers would be like the distance between Honolulu and Hilo or something like that? Yeah, twice. Something like that? Yes, okay. that, that's, that's good. Close so, enough, okay. And you can see this is just covered with craters like the moon. Right. Which means it's old, is that correct? Yes, okay. yes. And, and what's interesting about Vesta, apart from this gorgeous image which you brought for us? So we think this is um, made up of, uh, the surface is made up of basalts. It's an okay. asteroid that melted. The, uh, the metal went to the center to make the metallic core. Okay. And uh, what we're looking at is a basaltic surface. And we think we have meteorites from this asteroid so we can connect up the dots. Uh, and, and Vesta is where? In so v Vesta is in the main belt, uh, main asteroid belt uh, between Mars and Jupiter. Okay, okay. And, and uh, how do we get that spectacular image then? If so it, is that a telescopic image? Or so is this is the Dawn spacecraft that orbited okay. Vesta for uh, se several years. All right. And, and Vesta, it almost looks spherical. Not, not quite, but it was much rounder. Um, yes. Most of the asteroids that shaped, uh, you know, so do we the, have any diversity in the type of objects which we can see? So if they're round, then if they're very large, they tend to be round. Uh -huh. Gravity will make them round. But okay. if they're small, okay. like Itakawa, uh -huh. uh, they, then gravity is not strong enough to, to make them round. Okay. <laughs> and but you've got some other examples. This is Itakawa again. Yes. As we go. Okay. Here's All the, right. Now here's... Here's a dog bone. Isn't that amazing? Yes. It, it, what, what, what is this that we're looking at? So it's a, it's a radar image. It's not an optical a, a image. A radar we're image. Taken from Earth. From Earth. Yes. And it's a, an asteroid that we think is rich in iron, nickel, metal. Uh -huh. um, and uh, that's probably why it's this very unusual shape, because it's, it's probably all made of iron, nickel, metal. And it's a... Um, it's about 200 kilometers along. Does it, does it form in this shape, or do we have So, to... may... <laughs> we, we could guess this might be part of a metallic core of an asteroid, or, or it got reassembled from fragments of the core of an asteroid. Okay. And perhaps coated with some of the rock fragments, too. But I'm amazed that you can actually obtain a radar picture. Isn't that remarkable? Of something yes. so far away, millions of miles yes. away, correct? Yes, yes. yes. And, and as we go further through some of the other images, I think you've got some other really useful um, examples. And, and this one, is that its true shape, or what, what are we seeing? Yeah, it's, a, in this it's one? very deep shadows, but ah, you can okay. see that it's, uh, it's a funny looking shape, flattish on top. This one's about 50 kilometers across, and this one's actually a very dark asteroid. They've enhanced the. Right, a bit smaller the than the Oahu, then, correct? Yes, that's yeah. it. Okay. About and half the asteroids are, are dark like this one. And uh, interestingly enough, we think that uh, we do have some meteorites from this, which we call carbonaceous chondrites, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, because we think that uh, this, this meteorite, this asteroid, is also rich in carbon. And we used to think they formed in the asteroid belt, but now it's possible they're actually forming further away between the giant planets. So, so delving more into 
why bother studying meteorites and asteroids? What does it tell a scientist like yourself? You know, what, what are you trying to tease out of all of these samples? I mean, have? we have these incredible collection of rocks. Right. And they all contain clues about what was going on when the planets were forming. And that's what makes it so exciting. And, and, and you say when the planets were forming, that's soon after our sun started to yeah, shine? Yeah, so imagine the, the sun is, is creating out of this great cloud of gas and dust. Uh -huh. And uh, because it's rotating somewhat, we, as it uh, creates, we land up with this disk of dust and gas around the sun, the young sun. Okay. And we form from this tiny residue of material and the sun takes up so do, the rest. So do, do meteorites condense, if that's the right term, before the planets formed or at the same time? Well, we, we used to th say these are the, uh, the oldest, um, the oldest meteorites building that form blocks. the building blocks for making planets. But actually, it's more interesting than that because we think we've got different generations of of planets have some of the smallest uh -huh. objects that make the planets. And the, How do you know that? Well, it, it, because because of the radiometric dating uh -huh. and also logic, because the uh, the earlier the body formed, the more likely it was to melt because the clock, it, the aluminum twenty six is the heat source. It's, Every 700,000 years, there's less, 50% uh, less. Okay. So any body that accretes in the first one and a half million years will melt if it's more than 20 kilometers and, across. And, and, and so really early on in solar system history, it must have been really chaotic, right? Was it all the same as you went away from the sun? Or? No, uh, things took longer, further away. Okay. But we, as I say, we, we think we have meteorites that formed among the giant planets, or what were they, they the protoplanets, we would call them, the starting materials for the giant planets. And uh, we have uh, not only the chondrites, but we also have some of these rocks, meteorites from asteroids that melted. Some of them were in the asteroid belt, some of them were between the giant planets, and conceivably somewhere in the inner solar uh, system, uh, right near where the Earth was formed. Uh, uh, and I've heard that there's some debate amongst scientists like yourself that even the giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, may not have been at the same place, distance from the sun. Yes, yeah, that so that's today. one of the exciting things we've learned by looking at other solar systems, ah. other planetary systems, Okay. that giant planets migrate. And uh, it's conceivable that the asteroid belt is so small, the total mass is less than a thousandth of the Earth's mass because Jupiter migrated. Wow. Yeah. And fortunately for us, Saturn came along behind and pulled it back. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't be here. Okay. Alas, I won't digress today into exoplanets and other star systems, but I'm hoping in a future show we'll actually have a discussion on that. But in terms of our solar system, um, you've got all these rocky meteorites and asteroids. Um, was there anything different as you went further away? You, I think you brought along another image of something yes. which may not be a rocky asteroid. Is that yes, correct? Yes, let's look at the... the uh, let's look at the next slide. The last, this one is... Ah, a, good yeah. heavens. This is like the same shape as that radar image. But, but what, what, what is it? We're but this is a very here. different type of object. This is the nucleus of a comet. Uh, it's about seven kilometers across, mm -hmm. but it's very porous, very, it would float in water if you put it. It's uh, because we know that it's made up of dust grains, ice grains, and a lot of holes. It's okay. very porous. And, and again, uh, it's just incredible that you have an image of the nucleus of a comet, right? Absolutely, yes. And, yes. and, and I believe Thanks. you can even see uh, there appears to be some light stuff coming out of the the, the thin part, is, is that the comet's tail? Or? So uh, as, as the comet heats up, the ices evaporate and uh -huh. the, the molecules come off the surface and they bring some of the dust off. Wow. And uh, we think some, we have dust particles that have been collected by high-flying uh, airplanes. Okay. okay. And, the, uh, and, and I think that, that's the, la one. the last image which you, you brought along, right? From Just one more, that's it. There's, uh, um, what, what, what is this? Is this from that comet? Or? No, uh, it, it, but it is a dust particle that was recovered by one of these uh, planes that fly in the upper atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, a few microns across, so less than the width of your hair, 
It's a small particle in an electron microscope. And Unbelievable. We you can see it. It's very uh, porous, very uh, made up of lots of little different constituents. Okay. And we think this is probably coming from a comet. Don't know for sure, but almost certainly. What, 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 what is more informative to you and your colleagues? Having material like that IDP, the interplanetary dust particle, um, from a comet, or having a wonderful meteorite like this. I mean, uh, You're they, biased, I'm sure. But no, the amazing thing is we've got everything. Okay. We've got so many different types of material which seem to come from right across the solar system. Mm -hmm. we, we have meteorites that may be resembling what Mercury was forming, what the Earth was forming okay. from, and then we've got dust particles that are coming from bodies that formed outside the giant planets. Terrific. So you've got all this information, but What's the holy grail? What, what do you hope? So, it, you're an emeritus professor, right? But you're, you're still doing active research. Yes. So what do you hope to see in, say, the next five years in terms of, I guess you would call this early solar system geology or cosmic chemistry or something? What, what do you hope to... Yes, well, to what achieve? we hope to do is to fit together the information that we get from the meteorites into the models that astronomers have to explain how the planets form. Ast astronomers have models? Uh, yeah, astrophysicists okay. uh, who, who start from, from scratch thinking about disks of dust and gas and how they, the dust could accrete together into larger bodies. Okay. And now we have various different mechanisms that, that, that may well tell us how these planetesimals were forming. Okay, and I guess that's where the connection is between the kind of research that you do and our colleagues at the Institute for Astronomy, IFA, where they yes. can actually go and take a look at other star systems. That's right. They can and they image disks around young stars okay. and get clues as to how planets formed, and that's, that's where the excitement comes. So that, that's what motivates you in retirement to come in and work every day Absolutely. and still keep <laughs> working on some of these meteorites. Well, yes, it's, this it's, is it's fascinating it's stuff, Ed. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, thank you, Pete. Just, just to remind our viewers, uh, today we've been hearing from Dr. Ed Scott, who is an emeritus researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa, and you've been watching Think Tech Hawaii. And may I at least remind you to come back every Monday at 1 o'clock Hawaii Standard Time where I hope to introduce another of our research faculty here at the University of Hawaii. So until that time, thank you very much for watching the show. Goodbye.